Well, good morning, and again, uh, welcome. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Richard Schmierer. I'm the president and chairman of the board of the Middle East Policy Council. I'm very pleased to welcome you on behalf of the council to this, our 94th quarterly, quarter, uh, quarterly Capitol Hill Conference. Uh, the topics for, for today's program, uh, Saudi Arabian-Turkish rivalry in the Middle East, uh, is an issue uh, which we feel has gained quite a bit of, of prominence uh, in the aftermath uh, of the October 2nd murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Um, as information uh, about Khashoggi's fate emerged in the weeks following his death, um, a dynamic began to play out uh, between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. And this dynamic uh, suggests a, a kind of a rivalry uh, between the two countries uh, for influence uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and I think it's a dynamic that maybe has been underappreciated um, by those who follow uh, events in the region. And so today, uh, we'll have an opportunity to delve into that topic. Uh, before I turn to the program, however, I would like to say a few words uh, about the Middle East Policy Council. Uh, our organization was established in 1981. Uh, we're an NGO, and our purpose is to promote dialogue and education concerning the U.S. and the countries of the Middle East. Uh, we have three flagship programs. Uh, one is this conference, our quarterly ha Capitol Hill conferences. We hold these every three months uh, up here on the Capitol, uh, specifically because we are looking to try to engage with people here, staffers and others uh, who are involved in uh, U.S. policy issues. Uh, we have our journal. You probably saw some copies on the table uh, outside on the, as you came in. Uh, we're very proud of our journal. It's quite well known uh, for the, the information that we put out. We actually, it's found in 15,000 libraries around the world. Um, and so we feel that that's one of our really most effective programs. Uh, and then our third uh, main program is our Teach Mideast Educational Outreach Program. Uh, which basically is aimed at secondary school students and teachers. Uh, again, another uh, group whom we feel could do, learn more and, and uh, would do well to know more about the Middle East, and so that's what we uh, try to promote. So I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to visit us on our website, uh, which is www.mepc.org, or our Teach Mideast website, which is www.teachmideast.org. Uh, now let's turn to today's event. Uh, the program today is being live streamed uh, on our website, so let me also uh, welcome all of those who are viewing the program uh, via the internet this morning. Um, we will be uh, putting the proceedings of the conference up on our website, and we will also be publishing a transcript uh, of today's event in the next issue uh, of our journal. Uh, and there'll be a recap of the discussion put up on the website uh, in the next few days as well. Uh, with that, let me turn to our panelists. Uh, we'll begin the program with Ambassador Ryan Crocker, whom I had the honor of serving with in the U.S. Department of State as a Foreign Service Officer. Uh, Ryan has served as a diplomat, or had served as a diplomat for almost 40 years, uh, attaining the rank of career ambassador, which is the highest rank uh, in the Foreign Service. He held the position of U.S. Ambassador in six countries, Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Kuwait, Afghanistan, and Lebanon. Uh, he is currently diplomat in residence at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Hussein Ibish, who is a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf uh, States Institute in Washington. Uh, Dr. Ibish is a weekly columnist for Bloomberg and also for the UAE-based newspaper, The National. He is also a regular contributor to other U.S. and Middle Eastern publications and a frequent radio and TV commentator. Our third speaker is Professor Bulant Aras, is, who's on the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanchi University near Istanbul. Uh, he is also a visiting researcher at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Professor Aras has published 13 books on Turkish foreign relations, including several dealing with Turkey and the Middle East. I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us today. 
Uh, the program will begin with each panelist delivering brief opening remarks. Uh, this will be followed by a discussion session, which will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Mater, the Executive Director of the Middle East Policy Council. Now, please note that we have placed index cards on all of the seats. Please use these cards to write down any questions which you have as the speakers are speaking and hold them up so that our staff can collect the cards and give them to Dr. Mater, uh, who can then consolidate the questions for the Q&A uh, session. Uh, with that, let me turn the podium over to Ambassador Crocker. <clears throat> Orion, could you step up here for, for the video, for the presentation, it's a little better. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Richard, and good morning to all of you. Um, uh, you hang around the Middle East long enough, uh, uh, you get to meet a lot of people, and the nice thing about it is that they cycle through your life uh, uh, as one moves forward. And uh, recognize many people here, but um, uh, two in particular I'd just like to mention as um, exemplars of... Um, uh, good things in terrible times. Uh, my former colleague, uh, Anne, is here. Um, uh, like me, uh, she is a survivor of the April 1983 bombing of the American Embassy in Beirut. Um, unlike me, um, that blast broke just about every bone in Anne's body. Uh, uh, every single person who was injured in that attack and got to the American University Hospital alive, stayed alive. Uh, at that time, I think it was beyond doubt the best trauma center anywhere in the world because they had seen so much of it. And, and I will um, always remember going to visit you. Uh, um, and I just wanted to touch you in some way. And um, uh, with 117 different breaks or whatever it was. Uh, you were not generally available for touching, so I, I found a toe that looked whole and gave you a little tug on that toe. Uh, you never lost your positive outlook, uh, your cheerful attitude that uh, not only sustained you through that trial, uh, it, it, it reflected off the rest of us. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you for your service through that and then far beyond. And uh, another... And Mohammed is another figure from my past. I, I uh, didn't recognize him even when he introduced himself. Um, that's because uh, when we intersected, this would have been nine months before the horror of the embassy bombing, we intersected uh, in um, uh, September of 1982 um, in the immediate aftermath of another unspeakable horror, which was the massacre at the Shatila refugee camp. Uh, uh, I worked very intensely as a political counselor in Beirut at that time with some truly great Americans on this end, and uh, we were able to bring uh, him and his brother uh, to the U.S. Uh, again, uh, two among many, but these things count. They make a difference. Uh, we made a difference in your lives and those of your brother. Through the work you have done since you have been in this country, you have enriched all of our lives. So, uh, before I go into this now long sequence of doom and horror, uh, I just wanted to uh, get that out there, the, the, the small good things. Um, uh, so, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, um, great subject. Uh, let me tell you why. Uh, in very real and enduring ways, both countries have been absolutely critical U.S. partners um, in the aftermath of World War II. Um, uh, Turkey, a founding member of NATO, uh, uh, after World War I, of course, it, uh, Turkey no longer owned the Middle East as they had for centuries before under the Ottoman Empire, uh, but was always um, a, a place of significant influence and indeed advice um, uh, for us. So again, a, a critical NATO relationship 
uh, that, uh, that was there at the beginning, the, f the foundation of NATO. A little bit different, obviously, with Saudi Arabia, but also uh, an enduring relationship, uh, again, that goes back to 1945. Uh, the war was not even over in Europe. Uh, February 1945, the historic meeting between uh, a very ill FDR and even Saud on the deck of a U.S. warship in Great Bitter Lake, the USS Quincy. Um, uh, that an alien president would make that trip out uh, at that time um, and to have the meeting on a ship of war underscored the significance of what happened that, uh, that day in February 1945. Um, uh, that forged the enduring relationship with the kingdom and through the kingdom, with the, the heart of that region, um, based on the fundamental premise or transaction, if you will, although it became far more than that and is, uh, oil for security. Um, uh, oil, of course, had been discovered in Saudi Arabia uh, before the Second World War, but not really developed. Nonetheless, coming out of that war, we, we, we knew that uh, uh, clearly the largest uh, reserves in the world were likely to be lo located in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so present at the creation, if you will, uh, these, these relations go back very far and run very deep. Uh, in some respects, one could make, make the case that it's uh, closer, perhaps, with Turkey because of the NATO membership, uh, because we have uh, uh, still the use of Incirlik uh, in Turkey as an air base, uh, which has been crucial to a lot of what we've done and what we've done together uh, against the um, Islamic State. In, uh, in Syria and Iraq. It would have been a very different situation uh, for us, for the region, and indeed internationally, had we not uh, been able to uh, base many of our operations out, out of, out of Incirlik. So it, um, uh, it becomes pretty important. Uh, Turkey uh, stood with us in Korea. Uh, uh, they kind of wanted their troops to go wherever it was hardest. Um, I, I had a friend in later years who uh, had been in the military. He was um, of Greek origin and spoke, spoke Greece, Greek, uh, so was attached to uh, Greek troops uh, in, in, um, in Korea and recounted the story that he said he saw time after time the Turks would be given whatever impossibly hard objective there was to go take. There would be this tremendous din of gunfire, plumes and clouds of smoke, uh, and uh, battle after battle, when the smoke cleared, there would be a Turkish flag on top of whatever the objective was. Um, uh, the point kind of being here, don't mess with the Turks. So, uh, so we'll get into all kinds of things in the Q&A. So fast forward to, to um, where we are today uh, with both. A and you can say that... Um, if we are not in a relationship crisis with both, uh, we've skated pretty close to it. Um, and it, uh, I think with both countries, could get better, could get worse. Uh, for those of you who may be a little bit newer to the region than I, uh, bear in mind that as bad as things look in the Middle East, they in fact can get worse. Um, I'm kind of the poster boy for that. Um, um, there, there, there is no bottom. And again, I, I underscore here that uh, Turkey in its uh, post-World War I form, uh, not an Arab land, uh, ha does not control Arab lands in any uh, occupational sense, but uh, uh, because of its unique position, uh, can bring considerable influence to bear uh, on uh, on what happens in the Middle East. Uh, when, I, uh, when I left the Middle East for what I thought was the last time uh, as an ambassador, uh, early 2009, um, I, I looked back with, uh, with real gratitude for the Turkish role in Iraq at a, um, at a critical time. Uh, 
Uh, we had negotiated a very difficult set of agreements, uh, one on um, security, and that is something that serves as a framework for uh, our forces going forward, uh, and another, a much broader political agreement that uh, we envisioned at the time being the, um, uh, the basis for an ongoing relationship in Iraq and beyond Iraq, something the U.S. had never had before with any Iraqi government. Uh, the complexity of politics at that time um, uh, meant that it isn't over till it's over and then it isn't over. Uh, we, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Zabari and I signed the agreement uh, in October 2008. Um, uh, by signing it, we closed it. Uh, it would mean that it would um, go up to the Iraqi parliament for ratification with only an up or down vote possible. Uh, the, the text would not be reopened. Uh, we, we worked hard and we got, we got that positive vote. But then because democracies are complicated, uh, there was also the issue of the vice president signing off on it. Um, uh, uh, one of whom was Tark al Hashmi. Uh, uh, representing largely the, the Sunni community. And uh, he, I think with perfect reason, had a lot of questions uh, that we sought to answer. Uh, most critically at that time, uh, so did the Turkish envoy, with whom we worked very, very closely. He had a, uh, a, rep, uh, a connection that went back years with Iraq. And uh, I, I have always thought that bringing uh, the vice president finally aboard on that agreement had a great deal to do with the Turkish rule. I mean, these are things that uh, do not make the headlines uh, that no one knows about unless you're out there. Uh, how personalities count, how histories count, um, uh, and a little bit about how to try to, to manage those. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and uh, take any wax at a given administration. Maybe I actually will. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, again, looking at the, at the moment here, um, both Turkey and Saudi Arabia are in a process of, of significant uh, internal change. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, of course, with the uh, ascension of uh, President Erdogan, uh, uh, he has really remade the entire pole mill structure in, inside, of, uh, inside of Turkey, uh, something I, I never dreamed I would see with respect to the Turkish armed forces, the Turkish army. Um, I, just as luck would have it, um, I, I got to be in Istanbul uh, for you know, two of the coups, uh, 1970 and 1980. Um, uh, so had a certain sense of the, uh, the resilience of Turks. I mean, the restaurants stayed open, the bars stayed open, and um, traffic was way down. It was kind of nice. It's, um, uh, but it, it also left me with the sense that uh, we're just going to have to live with the fact that uh, the army is never going to be checked by a civilian government. Uh, well, that happened. Um, uh, and continues to go on happening, if you will. Uh, the... You know, so what role does President Erdogan now envision uh, in the Middle East? Um, I'm not going to start going on here about the Kurds because I know that will come up and we can address it there. Just pointing it, just, just saying. Uh, it's not that I forgot it. It's just something I don't want to try to deal with in these remarks. Um, uh, so, so what's the look forward? Uh, you know, what's, uh, what's the outlook beyond Idlib? Uh, What's the outlook beyond um, Manbij? Um, you know, these are, these are places that no one had ever heard of in this country, but then we'd never heard of um, an obscure archduke uh, in an even more obscure town called Sarajevo in August 1914. Um, uh, there are any number of flashpoints uh, as we look ahead on Syria. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about that, too. In the meantime, dust off your Barbara Tuchman book, uh, The Guns of August, the war that nobody wanted and everybody got. 
uh, and apply that to some of the developments in, uh, in Syria now involving the Syrian regime, the Israelis, the Turks, the Russians, and you can see how, you can kind of see how World War I got started. Um, and uh, again, I won't predict doom here, I'll let my colleagues do it and all of you. Um, um, uh, again, in Saudi Arabia, we no longer rely on Saudi oil, but boy, believe me, our friends do. Uh, particularly our friends in Asia, uh, Japan and South Korea, for example. Uh, so the question, and I don't have the answer, I hope it will come out of our conversation, um, is our special relationship with these two countries um, now going somewhere that it really has not been effectively since 1945? Um, and that would be somewhere not good. Uh, is it with Saudi Arabia, is it going to be the, uh, the, the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, someone that I think probably everyone in this room has had some contact with, um, uh, and the, uh, 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 the war in, in Yemen, We've all seen in this building, uh, how the Senate now has uh, reacted to that, the, both the killing and the war. Uh, where is that going to take us? Where is a completely new leadership approach with uh, the ascension of Mohammed bin Salman? Where's that going to take the relationship if we get over these current challenges? Because uh, this is different. Um, and in Turkey, uh, to a very large degree, I, um, I believe that where we are in Turkey has a lot to do with the Europeans, quite frankly. Um, uh, because basically, over time, the message from the EU became pretty clear. Um, uh, you Turks, you're certainly good enough to be a founding member of NATO, so you can fight and die for us, uh, should that need arise, but you're never going to be good enough to join the Gentlemen's Club of the European Union. Uh, I, I, I believe, and I put this out there and, uh, so that you can tear it apart, uh, um, that, that that had something not insignificant to do with the rise of a politician who could tap into um, that, that sense of um, uh, being dissed by, by the West. Um, uh, to, to take the message to Anatolia, not simply the drawing rooms of, of Istanbul or Ankara, uh, and develop a really impressive popular constituency something his predecessors did not have. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this in, in a much more authoritative way. I did want to lay that out there. Uh, the last thing I'll say here, because it's what I know the least about, um, um, the ideological or theocratical differences between the two that we may be seeing play out a bit in um, uh, the Khashoggi incident. Um, uh, the leadership of both Turkey and Saudi Arabia um, uh, have a an ideology, if you will, that they support. In, in Saudi Arabia, of course, it's uh, it's the Salafi trend, uh, persistently and wrongly labeled Wahhabism in this country and much of the West. It's not, and Dr. Ibish can explain all about that. Um, uh, in Turkey, with the President Erdogan, it's the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, now, the Muslim Brotherhood comes in a huge variety of flavors. Uh, uh, you know, one of them uh, would be the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, uh, which was way off on the far end of the scale, um, meaning that they were very big on car bombs, truck bombs, bomb bombs, anything else they could make blow up in Damascus or Aleppo or elsewhere, this uh, going through the 1970s. Um, well, Hafez al-Assad and Brother Rifat cornered him in Hama, and uh, everybody in this room knows what happened February 1982. Nobody outside this room has a clue, uh, but had a significant amount to do with the, uh, the civil war that broke out in, um, in, in 2011. Uh, at the, the other end of the... Uh, of the continuum, I, I would suggest you would find, say, the, um, the Muslim brothers in Turkey, 
um, and in Iraq uh, as pledged to the system, and indeed in the case of uh, Turkey, certainly it is a system uh, through, through President Erdogan. Um, so this notion that we should, uh, you know, label the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization uh, is as dangerous as it is idiotic, quite frankly. I mean, uh, you know, we would, who are we going to talk to uh, in Iraq? Who are we going to talk to in Turkey? And if you want to talk about an assault on uh, the uh, democratically elected leader of a NATO member, that, that would be it, at least in my view. Um, Muslim Brothers in Egypt, of course, uh, eschewed violence years ago uh, and is the only organized uh, non-state-controlled political apparatus uh, after the fall of Mubarak position to win the elections as they did. Um, and we all know how that's gone since. Um, so uh, again, I, I pose these out there as questions for my colleagues to, to address. Um, uh, you know, again, in particular, the, the role of Islamic ideology in both countries, or lack thereof, maybe it's all completely overstated, I just, uh, I just don't know. Uh, but we need to talk about it. And it, that has a lot to do, in my view, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the crisis in the Gulf, if you will, uh, between Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, uh, and the state of Qatar, which has, uh, I don't know how many Muslim brothers are in the state of Qatar, but they have certainly assisted Muslim Brotherhood organizations outside to the uh, uh, extreme displeasure of the Saudis. So it is a immensely tangled set of issues that we're wrestling with here. Um, I, my, my bottom line, I suppose, is um, uh, as, as, as frustrating and difficult as they are, they're also extremely important. Uh, do we really want to lurch forward um, farther into the 21st century with our relationships with both of these powers? And they're seminal relationships uh, uh, in tatters and getting worse. Uh, do they? Um, and what's the way forward? So having posed all the questions, thank you for allowing me that opportunity. Uh, I turn it over to my colleagues who will produce all the answers. Thank you. Are there any questions yet to be picked up on the cards? Our staff will come around and get them. Oh, Hussein, please. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. That's a, uh, certainly a tough act to follow. Um, and. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Uh, the, 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 the key word in the title of this uh, uh, symposium is rivalry, right? And, and I think what it gets at is the unstable nature of the uh, relations between Ankara and Riyadh, how multifaceted they are, how changing they are. And I want to try to kind of describe that and particularly from a, uh, a Gulf Arab point of view, or at least a Saudi point of view. But I think the, what sets the stage for this more than anything else, um, as Ambassador Crocker was saying, is that the turn by Turkey away from the West and towards the East, largely because of the rebuff of the EU uh, that helped to give rise, as you suggested, to the AKP in general and Erdogan in particular, uh, Turkey's vision of its of the epicenter of its foreign policy shifted from uh, an engagement with Europe to an engagement with the Middle East, looking back at its um, former imperial lands and to its um, fellow Muslim countries in the Arab world and other parts of the Islamic world. Uh, and this is a, a core element of uh, Erdogan's ideology, of the AKP appeal, of uh, the alliance that they have with other forces in Turkey. So it can't be understated the extent to which um, Erdogan has ridden this wave and also then led Turkey in that direction can't really be overstated. Um, and that, of course, has greatly altered the nature of the Saudi-Turkish relationship. And this is all even, um, of course, exacerbated by the uh, sort of very aggressive, especially domestic but even regional approach that uh, the AKP and Erdogan have taken after the failed coup of 2016. That's, again, that just simply emphasizes so every time 
this process has gone through a change, it has been emphasized, and, and uh, there's a kind of distillation uh, going on here. So it's very important. And what, what you end up with is a situation where, very recently, in the context of the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, as, as you say, a, a good friend, um, uh, more than one senior Turkish leader said, Turkey is the only logical leader of the Islamic world. Now, whether that means the whole ummah or the Sunni ummah or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It is, it is really, in a certain sense, a direct challenge to Saudi Arabia, which presents itself as the logical leader uh, on the grounds of history, on the grounds of geography, on the grounds of custodianship of the holy sanctuaries. And this unstated position uh, since the beginning of the third Saudi state in the 20s, that only Saudi Arabia has a pure Islamic system that relies on the Quran and not any kind of written constitution and whatnot. So, you know, when you've got a Turkey that sees itself not as an integral part of Europe, but as the only rational leader of the Muslims of the world, you've got a rivalry situation with Saudi Arabia, I think, by definition. Um, and you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to try to characterize the way Turkey sees its own foreign policy because I'm not an expert in Turkey. And because I think it's also very hard, though I think my colleagues will do this, it's become very difficult, at least for me, to see where Turkish national interests, as they are defined by the state, end and the political interests of the AKP and the personal interests of President Erdogan begin. This is, uh, it seems to me, a very fuzzy, fuzzy line. Now, uh, maybe our colleagues can, can educate us, but so for me, that makes it a bit difficult. Um, but describing the situation from a, uh, a Saudi perspective, uh, you know, I'll just tell you basically how Riyadh, I think, how Riyadh looks at Turkey, and it, it will explain a lot of things. And first of all, I do think uh, Saudi Arabia sees Turkey, first of all, as a rival, just in those terms, another large state in the region with allies and with a strong military and with a major presence uh, that is capable of projecting power and has to be taken seriously as another large state. Uh, second, I think that that's offset by seeing uh, Turkey as a necessary uh, balance or ballast against Iran. The, the, the uh, major Gulf Arab concern since 1979, and particularly since 2003, has been the idea of a revolutionary hegemonic Iran, which is both uh, aggressively Shiite and revolutionary at the same time, and Persian, it combines all these kind of very uh, threatening identitarian um, qualities that, that has scared um, the Gulf countries and especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE very greatly. And that Turkey, under almost any circumstances, looks a lot less threatening than that. I mean, it's very hard to imagine Turkey being seen as qu having quite that mix of threatening characteristics. So Turkey is an obvious, necessary uh, ballast against Iranian influence. But at the same time, Turkey is another potential hegemon now that it's looking east, right? And I think that there are uh, places in the Arab world, including in the Gulf, where memories of Ottoman rule are not extinguished, where talk about the only rational leadership of the Islamic world hits hard, where uh, the, the Turkish efforts to cultivate their... Um, regional alliances with, for example, with Qatar and with Muslim Brothers and others in, in the region, which I'll talk more about, uh, are seen as evidence of this growing potential hegemonic agenda. Right? Um, and, of course, the neo-Ottoman rhetoric that sometimes is engaged in by various Turks, including AKP people and, and, such, uh, and friends of the AKP, uh, is noticed in the Gulf, and it's taken note of, and it's taken exception to. So now, t I don't think that, I think this is more along the lines of a potential issue rather than an immediate one or a real one, but it's very much there. What's more alarming, and this is where the, uh, you can see how the 
the Khashoggi murder has brought this last um, anxiety to the fore is the idea of Turkey as the leader of a rival third camp in the Middle East. And I think almost everyone accepts the idea that there are two rival camps in the Middle East. Uh, one is a kind of pro-Iranian alliance, mostly Shiites, also Bashar al-Assad, and a few others, some Lebanese Christians as well, but mostly a Shiite alliance. Even the Houthis are part of this in a weird way, even though they're not 12 or Shiites, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that the, everyone, I think, accepts that there is a pro-Iranian camp. And generally speaking, those opposed to Iran are seen as... Uh, uh, as comprising a second camp, no matter how loose it may be. I mean, obviously, when you've got uh, Israel and the Gulf states in the same kind of general camp, it's not much of a camp since they don't have relations. Even though they're working on building relations, it's, it's, it's much less, let's say, vertically integrated than the Iranian one uh, is. And that's a, a real problem for this camp. But I think it's fair to say there is, an, a, there is a distinctly anti-Iranian camp led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And uh, you could look at it as a pro-American camp, or you could call it whatever you like. Now, many people end that, but not the Gulf Arabs. The Gulf Arabs, the Saudis and the Emiratis would say, oh, no, there is a third camp. There is a third distinct camp. And it is the Sunni Islamist camp. And it is led by Turkey. And it includes brotherhood parties all over the Middle East and Qatar. And this is an ideological camp. And that's one of the reasons why we have a boycott of Qatar. And it's one of the reasons why we're so upset, is that we see that this group is not loyal to the anti-Iranian cause. It's really kind of Turkish-oriented. And uh, I think there's. Uh, while there is a sense that, Ira that Turkey helps to balance Iran, there is also an understanding that Turkey and Iran historically do not go to war, and Turkey and Iran are not going to fight it out. And it's very hard to imagine a situation where the Turks and the Iranians don't do some kind of deal in any given situation to share their interests. And what this is not um, making anyone in the Gulf sleep it, uh, any easier. In other words, it's easy to imagine the Turks and the Iranians just by splitting the difference at their expense, right? So this is, this is highly alarming. And then when they, when they imagine the rise of a third camp, uh, which is completely beyond their control, it looks like the whole region is fragmenting, and it looks like a net loss to them, right? Because this camp would not be in the pro-Iranian uh, corner, it ought to be, this thinking goes, part of a Saudi-led pro-American alliance, right? And what are the Qataris doing playing footsie uh, with the Turks? Why are the Turks running around trying to build alliances in our back? They sh everyone should be working together in coordination with the United States to offset Iranian hegemony. And this just looks like a terrible kind of uh, betrayal of that. And so here, I think, is the epicenter of concern right now, is the idea that Turkey is the leader of this rival camp. And actually, the thinking goes even further. It's almost always unstated. But there is this deep fear that this third camp, if it exists at all, I mean, many people would say it doesn't, but this third camp could evolve into a very dangerous, the most dangerous thing imaginable, really, which is an alternative to the current pro-American camp of Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE and a very loose arrangement with the Israelis and the Egyptians and others to kind of stabilize the region. In other words, it's imaginable from a, I think, from a Gulf nightmarish perspective that the United States would conclude that this alliance is fundamentally unworkable, dysfunctional, falls apart, and look at the GCC, uh, you know, having completely fallen to pieces over Qatar and with, you know, Kuwait even moving away and whatnot. And there, I think there is a concern that if the pro-Turkish camp, the Sunni Islamist camp, could strengthen enough, you could see it not only vertically integrating, but starting to bring in other countries that are nominally part of the pro-Saudi camp, but could conceivably defect. And I'm talking here particularly about Kuwait and Jordan. So in other words, you can imagine a block of Turkey, Jordan, uh, Qatar, uh, and Kuwait 
providing an alternative ballast for the United States against Iran in a, in a, a much more vertically integrated um, alliance. Now, you could easily turn around and say, look, Washington is not going to get in bed with a Muslim Brotherhood uh, coalition. The Jordanians are not going to join this. What are you talking about? I'm not talking about a reality. I'm talking about an anxiety, <laughs> but it's a very real anxiety. It's often unstated, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't convey that nightmare scenario to you because it's very much out there. And you could see all of this playing out in the context of the uh, Khashoggi uh, affair. And I think the, the Khashoggi affair really kind of tells you where relations are. Because, and, and particularly if you look at how Turkey managed the scandal, um, it was very, very deftly done by, uh, by, the, by Erdogan and his people. What they, obviously, they saw this as a great opportunity to be devil and hobble a regional rival, right? And they did that. Saudi Arabia in general, and Mohammed bin Salman in particular, were kind of targeted, and uh, the, the drip, drip, drip of information, the mixing of credible information with absolutely lurid exaggeration. They're hard to exaggerate the, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, but they managed to do it, like live dismemberment and slow cutting off of fingers, and stuff, stuff that's no longer at all discussed, this hilarious idea that the whole thing was transmitted live on his Apple Watch uh, just, you know, really kind of silly stuff, all mixed together to make sure that this story did not leave the front page for weeks and weeks, right? And then uh, in a kind of un uncoordinated partnership with the Washington Post that wanted to keep, you know, quite rightly considered this a, a killing in the family and is still hammering away at it, which I think is, is uh, perfectly understandable. Um, but at the same time, Turkey did not want to precipitate a rupture with Saudi Arabia because uh, it, it doesn't um, serve their, what serves their interest is to weaken Saudi Arabia, but not create a total meltdown. So there was never a public accusation against Mohammed bin Salman from senior Turkish leaders. It was all, un, it was implicit or it was um, said by anonymous officials in the media. It was always deniable. Uh, and President Erdogan has gone to great lengths to shield uh, King Salman from any question. And I mean, it, it's a little, it's, it, it doesn't really withstand scrutiny because the king is, I mean, Mohammed bin Salman is not the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia the way, say, Mohammed bin Zayed is the de facto leader of Abu Dhabi. He's the, maybe a day-to-day -day ruler, but I don't know anyone who's serious about Saudi politics who doesn't recognize that the king retains ultimate authority here. S you know, major national decisions are not being made against the wishes of the king. That's just not where we are here. And he's not a vegetable who can't be consulted the way some other uh, titular leaders may be. That's not the situation. Otherwise, he wouldn't have seen this grand tour of Asia, which he managed to pull off recently enough that we can be pretty sure about. Now, outsourcing day-to-day -day administration to somebody else is not the same as relinquishing authority. So when Erdogan writes in the Washington Post that I am absolutely sure that King Salman had nothing to do with this and no knowledge of it, hint, hint, hint about his son, but not actually saying it. And therefore, this does not constitute an act of policy. Therefore, we do not have to break relations with Saudi Arabia. It tells you exactly the kind of narrow tightrope that the Turks very successfully, not walked along, but danced merrily up and down on with great success. And, and I think they did manage to greatly strengthen their hand and greatly weaken uh, the Saudi reputation, particularly the Crown Prince, create all kinds of headaches uh, for uh, the, the Saudi government. And uh, it also managed to un unload Brunson, right? Pastor Brunson, who was useful for a while and then became an unbelievable headache. And the question was, how do we get rid of this guy without looking like we've caved into the Americans? Oh, this was a perfect opportunity. So they released Brunson, right? Get all the credit with Trump. Nobody in Turkey said, oh, you've caved to the Americans. They all said, what a brilliant move. What a smart guy you are. So it was just perfect. It was like ex ex excising a rotten tooth or something. It was just great. So I'm, I'm actually impressed with the, with the skill with which this was handled. And I think what it, what it shows you is how bipolar, and I use that term advisedly, 
Turkish-Saudi relations are within the uh, context of this rivalry. They're pendular, right? They tend to swing back and forth between cooperation, uh, particularly when it comes to reducing the role of Iran or in some other instances, versus a kind of unstated cooperation. And I think if you look at the way uh, their relations have developed on Syria, you can see how that works really well. When the, uh, when the uprising began in earnest, um, both Turkey and Gulf countries were supporting uh, armed Sunni rebel groups, uh, sometimes, especially in the case of Qatar, the same groups, sometimes groups that were operating in coordination, and there was really a fairly close alliance to try to get rid of al-Assad. After the, uh, the joint intervention by Iran and Russia in 2015, the bolstering of al-Assad, saving of al-Assad, let's put it that way, the, the, the actual rescue of the guy by this foreign intervention and the big surge in military event, the, and the coup in Turkey all helped to reshape Turkish ideas about what should happen in Syria to emphasize containing the growing power of Kurds in the southern border of Turkey uh, and not caring so much about the future of al-Assad anymore, which really was one of the two or three things that kind of killed the, the ambition of the Gulf countries to get rid of a pro-Iranian regime in Damascus and replace it with a neutral or an anti-Iranian regime, uh, therefore taking away this major Iranian asset. The Turkish interest in that kind of went away. And there was this period of almost confrontation in Syria where uh, the groups that were supported directly or indirectly by Gulf countries were were almost being targeted by, by Turkey. And there was a real confrontation of interest there. And I think what you've seen is that under the rubric of a, of a Trump administration policy that's becoming much more coherent in Syria and is focused on doing exactly what the Gulf countries were hoping for, which is working, first of all, on the ground to, to, to block Iranian uh, interests, especially from creating a military corridor through Iraq and, and uh and Syria to the Mediterranean, that seems to be out. I mean, a, a year and a half ago, I would have said that may well happen, but it's not going to, largely because of the, uh, the Trump administration not leaving Syria. But in addition, the, the, there's a, a move by the Trump uh, administration to start a dialogue with Turkey especially, but also with Russia, try to see what can be done to squeeze, to marginalize the Iranians, to make sure that Tehran is not the big winner in Syria and limit their gains. And so this is all very positive. Um, so all of that kind of indicates the way in which Saudi Arabia and Turkey can still find themselves on the, roughly on the same side. At the same time, you've just seen uh, Turkey enter into a new military cooperation agreement with Kuwait, which again raises this fear of a, uh, a new Turkish hegemony, and B, the emergence of a camp that could even stretch out to incorporate countries that most people couldn't imagine being part of it. And again, I mentioned Jordan and Kuwait as possibilities. Now, it may, it may be fanciful, but uh, when you see new uh, military cooperation agreements, uh, that tends to exacerbate uh, fears. Um, so what we end up with then is a, uh, is a really kind of bipolar, pendular relationship. And let me just say, I, I, I want to uh, end by thoroughly endorsing uh, Ambassador Crocker's uh, comment about there being no bottom in the Middle East. You know, things can always get worse, right? That's for sure. And, uh, you know, as usual, kind of Shakespeare wrote it best. Edgar in King Lear says, uh, this is not the worst so long as we can still say this is the worst. <laughs> And I think that's exactly right, and that's always the case. Thank you. Sure. Uh, any more cards for us? <clears throat> well, uh, uh, thanks for all uh, participating in this conference, and I'd like to first uh, thank the Middle East Policy Council for inviting me. And I'll say a word about my involvement with Middle East Policy Council. I published my first academic article back in 1998 in Middle East Policy. That's why it's always an important journal for, for me. And since then, I continue to publish. I think that's the reason uh, you invited me to talk on 
Saudi Arabian Turkish rivalry in the Middle East. Uh, I'm not surprised that you know I agreed uh, with uh, what uh, Dr. Ibish said uh, in his speech, and that's the result of rational thinking. But I'm not referring here. He's the more rational Turks or the Saudis. I don't like to carry this. Uh, who is more rational? Uh, uh, content between the, the leadership to here, uh, but uh, uh, I certainly agree uh, what he, he said so far in uh, in many areas. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to start with a warning, and I believe it will be a false start to evaluate Turkish-Saudi Arabian relations merely as a rivalry. Uh, it's rather, you know, uh, it may be defined as concurrent uh, elements of competition and cooperation together. Uh, if we go back to AKP's uh, coming to power, it was indeed a welcome development in Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia since, the, you know, the President Erdogan, the former President Gül, and their efforts to mend Man defenses with the Arab world and in general Muslim world uh, has been considered as an asset in Saudi Arabia back then. And don't forget, you know, uh, the Saudis nodded to election of a uh, Turkish professor as secretary general of the OIC. This would never happen without uh, without Saudi approval back then, the professor Ekmeleddin Ihsanoğlu. Uh, from Saudi perspective, uh, at the outset, Erdogan was, uh, you know, was an asset uh, as a pro-Western uh, Middle Eastern leader, and the Saudis also approved, you know, the fast-growing Turkish GCC relations back mid uh, 2000s. Uh, indeed, uh, I also published a piece at Middle East Policy on Turkey and the GCC back then. There was a bright prospect between Turkey and Saudi Arabia within the framework of the GCC. Uh, you know, the game changer here has been the Arab Spring and the Turkish position in the Arab Spring, Turkish support to Muslim Brotherhood movements, and in general, you know, this, what has been called in Turkey as electoral transition in those countries. And that means, you know, the popular vote, uh, which at the end means, you know, uh, political Islam and Muslim Brotherhood. But be beyond this, and of course this position almost has been an anathema of the Saudi position, which desires to go back to, you know, pro Arab Spring status quo. But however, beyond the differences in ideology, there was also, you know, the Turkey's increasing, increasing influence in North Africa, in uh, Central Asia, uh, Levant, and even in Yemen. Uh, so, and also, you know, uh, a, as an example of, you know, this, uh, this concurrent elements of cooperation and competition, Syria is a very good example. At the outset, you know, both uh, wanted to uh, overthrow uh, uh, Assad regime in Syria, but later on it turned out that uh, this issue became, you know, a matter of rivalry or uh, competition, conflict between those. Since they supported, you know, different kind of transition in Syria and they backed different groups in Syria, uh, while the overall and overarching common goal of throwing uh, Assad uh, in Syria. Well. Uh, there have been a brief period, uh, even after Arab Spring, or during the Arab Spring in 2015, uh, after the demise of King Abdullah, there was a chance of rapprochement or you know, approximation between these two countries. And at that time, Erdogan followed you know, uh, wise policy of uh, increasing his uh, re re rhetoric of condemnation of Iran. Uh, he backed Saudi position in Yemen, and all he wanted is Saudi support in return in Syria. And, you know, if you remember the uh, early 2015, this Saudi-Turkish position uh, brought Assad to the brink of collapse in 2015, but uh, it, it didn't survive much, and mostly because of Erdogan's, uh, hesit uh, Erdogan's reticence to, you know, to, to back uh, uh, wider Saudi designs, for example, you know, this army of Islam against Iran. Well, this divergence has been very costly to Turkey. Uh, although, you know, there was a brief period that 
uh, at least there was a sense that Obama administration is supporting Turkish position in the beginning, but other than uh, it's po not possible to argue that Turkey uh, gained much uh, following this course of line in the Arab Spring. Syria became a major burden, isolated Turkey from the Middle East, and regional instability and insecurity hurt Turkish interests, Turkish access to Arab markets, uh, and the Gulf finance in, uh, in a wider sense. And also on the Saudi side, it was a strategic blunder, I believe, to alienate Turkey and their clumps effort to contain Iran. Uh, there is also a UAE factor here. Uh, Back in you know, 2011, in particular in Libya case, UAE adopted an emotional position against Turkey. Why Turkey is choosing Qatar you know, the over the, uh, the rise in shining uh, Gulf you know, of the country, UAE? And, and this UAE line against Turkey has been able to convince the Saudi Arabia, uh, Arabia according to you know, the Turkish perception of what's happening in the Gulf, the UAE line has been successful to persuade uh, Saudis that Turkey and Qatar are enemies who are open to Iranian position, and they are dangerous to pro-Western Saudi Arabia and UAE in the region. Well, the feelings are mutual. Uh, there was a, you know, this widening, uh, this uh, widening distaste against the UAE. Uh, the pro-government circles believe in, you know, uh, believing that UAE was behind uh, the uh, failed coup against Turkish government and, of course, with uh, Saudi approval. Well, in the meantime, uh, looking at the U.S. factor for Turkish leadership for the AKP, uh, well, uh, they had a euphoric welcome for Trump administration. Uh, their perspective was uh, the new president is going to you know, find the common ground with Turkey and Syria. They are going to extradite uh, this Turkish Islamic preacher, Fethullah Gülen, in, who lives in the United States to Turkey. And even they are going to adopt, you know, a tougher stance in Syria that will isolate Iran uh, in Syria. But Turkey, in return, got uh, Saudi, UAE, Trump alliance, uh, which uh, hurt it. Uh, which are Turkish interests in Syria, uh, and this which is following a destabilizing line against Iran, which will eventually uh, lead to deconstructive spillover impact uh, in Turkey. Uh, while this euphoric welcome has turned out uh, to a disappointment in a short peri period of time, and there is here a UAE Saudi factor in this disappointment. Well, the blockade against Qatar in June 2017 has been also considered as a, you know, this final move against Turkey to isolate Turkey from the Gulf, Middle East, and, and even beyond. And that's why uh, Turkey took, you know, a vital action to provide, you know, the daily products to Qatar, uh, to save Qatar against the Saudi-led coalition. And they, you know, uh, reinforced the Turkish military presence over there to prevent any kind of maneuver against, you know, the pro-Turkish Sheikh Tamim. Well, at that time, there was also, you know, this Erdogan's attempt to uh, mediate between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. That may be an example to bipolarity. Dr. Ibish was referring. But however, uh, that has been rebuffed by the Sau Saudis that, you know, uh, it's too late. And later on, it turned out that you know, the Turkish military presence became a, a, a strong part of the Saudi ultimatum against Qatar. Uh, well, there is a Mohammed bin Salman factor here. Uh, he is the elephant in the room uh, when it comes to Turkish-Saudi uh, relations. Well, there are many conspiratorial reports, arguments, uh, if you follow the Turkish media, but however, it's uh, real that, you know, the Mohammed bin Salman himself in March 2018 called Turkey as a part of, you know, axis of, uh, and an axis of evil, you know, like uh, uh, part of a coalition uh, that uh, Iran and Daesh also uh, takes place. I believe this was, a, you know, his outburst of the confrontational approach that both sides adopted, and, uh, and now we see that both sides are unable to recover and in particular from Turkish perspective, uh, due to <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman's decision to eliminate all rivals uh, in the region. 
Well, Mohammed bin Salman's agenda to gather an anti-Iran bloc in the region, his assertive moves from Yemen to Qatar, and willingness to ally with Israel, uh, I believe alienated uh, Turkish expectation uh, to co-opt Saudis in any way in their re regional policy. Uh, while the Crown Prince's you know, unwavering opposition to Muslim Brotherhood, uh, hence the Turkish and the Qatari position left no room uh, for co cooperation uh, at the moment. Well, again, going back to uh, UAE role, uh, UAE is, you know, uh, as a far, uh, orchestrating, you know, the openly anti-Turkish <coughs> efforts in all possible platforms from Sudan to Somalia to Washington and the Western capital. <coughs> And it was never lost on the Turkish foreign policy elite that UAE funded a number of UN members and Turkey's bid for you know, uh, membership to the UN uh, Security Council. And this is going to be never lost on Turkish foreign policy elite because uh, that resulted in a, you know, a kind of humiliation uh, of Turkish defeat uh, with around 60 votes out of under than 93, uh, just, you know, few years earlier, uh, this was a reverse, and Tur Turkey, you know, even uh, unanimously elected as uh, uh, member of UN uh, Security Council. Uh, so, well, if we come to Khashoggi case, uh, it certainly helped Erdogan to gain a moral ground in regional politics. And I think this is the start of this uh, rationality discussion that, you know, um, that hurts uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE line in the region. Well, it's not a secret that Ankara would utilize any possible means to limit Mohammed bin Salman's role in Saudi politics. Uh, well, and probably to encourage, you know, the other uh, moderate elements, if there are any in in, in Saudi, in Saudi politics. Well, even some degree, we hear the expectation is not to change Saudi domestic landscape, but even you know, uh, some some progress will be considered a success in uh, in Turkey. Well, we are here referring to a very delicate re relationship with Saudi Arabia after Khashoggi case. Well, on the one hand, Tur Turkey certainly wants to have access to Gulf finance, but on the other hand, it finds itself, you know, uh, in the middle of this dangerous uh, Turkish-Iranian rivalry. And here there is, a, you know, uh, an emerging rival leader in Saudi Arabia. So what Turkey can do is to use the Khashoggi case to weaken uh, Mohammed bin Salman, but keeping King Salman and the Saudi Arabia aside, uh, and then, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tight rope, uh, but however, there is a belief that uh, this can work to preserve the relations with Saudi Arabia while weakening Mohammed bin Salman's role in Saudi politics or his uh, assertive line against Turkey. But, but that's a matter of time to see. But however, I'm, you know, the almost 100% sure that uh, Turkey cannot put its domestic integrity into further risks with directly confronting either Saudi Arabia or Iran. That's out of possibility. And, and we see it, you know, uh, the, while the Erdogan is playing Khashoggi case very well, but however, uh, there is a certain degree of caution as well. Uh, that's why, you know, my analysis on the Khashoggi affair and its aftermath is that uh, it is actually a negotiation to moderate the attrition of rivalry and consolidate Turkish interests in the Gulf. But this is aside from the humanitarian tragedy that I wish that would never happen. Well, overall, the UAE-Qatar rivalry is a major setback for Gulf stability. Uh, and the Gulf crisis in itself underlines to find a common ground among the GCC. So uh, in order to make a, you know, the rationality discussion and the rationality uh, in terms of leadership, you know, changed the region, the U.S. role, etc. First, you know, there is need to put the house in in order, and then uh, probably we can talk of rationality. And and you know, the U.S. funded or led uh, cold peace is not going to bring a peace to the to the geography, and which will you know uh, continue this uh, ongoing rift and 
will alienate uh, other actors which can indeed play uh, some, some roles. For, from my perspective, uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia needs to find a common ground on, on regional matters, which will certainly calm many issues in that geography from, you know, uh, from Palestinian questions, even in Yemen. Uh, well, so Saudis can play a role uh, to put an end to you know the uh, Turkish-Egyptian rift. Uh, well, and that that can start from here in a way that Turkey can provide you know uh, a counterbalancing role in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, which uh, I believe Saudi Arabia needs uh, very much. If we are talking about you know working together towards a, a regional common end. Uh, such a common uh, ground is a necessity, and I believe there is room for reconciliation between Turkey and Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia. These are, you know, two major Sunni powers. Uh, probably, you know, Erdogan's transformation of Turkey may help in that sense that, you know, uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia may understand each other better uh, in comparison to to the earlier uh, terms. But, however, it certainly requires, you know. Uh, Saudi's distances from anti-Qatar position and moderation towards the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, you may think, you know, this is not realistic, but but the alternative is is the illusory perspectives of any stability and peace. While thinking more academically, uh, I'm a, you know the professor of international relations and geopolitics. What I see is, you know, uh, geopolitical crimes committed by all sides. And I believe, you know, the, the choice is now between continuing to commit these geopolitical crimes for authoritarian survival at home, you know, keeping the power, uh, domestic hold on power, or uh, a little bit sacrificing for it uh, towards a common ground, good ground for addressing the crisis in the geography. And this is all what I'm going to say for now. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank everyone for good presentations. And um, I think it would be good if we could come out of this meeting with some ideas for um, the future of American policy. Um, so we might begin with um, an issue that was touched on but maybe not covered enough, which would be this. Um, when Turkey and Saudi Arabia both look at the international system and look at maybe um, declining American power and influence and commitment and engagement after the, uh, well, certainly, um, certainly over the last 10 or 15 years, um, and when they consider perhaps advice that they've given to the United States that hasn't been followed, as for example, the, the King Abdullah advising the United States not to invade Iraq, which then led the, left the door open for Iran to enter the region, or um, the Turks um, not being happy about um, the way the U.S. enabled the Kurds to have autonomy in Iraq in the 1990s and beyond, or the way the United States did not engage uh, deeply enough in Syria after 2011. To what extent has this changing um, global picture and the, the changing role and the changing role of, of, of uh, American power and engagement at the same time that Russia started to come back into the region? How has this uh, influenced decisions that both countries have taken that have that have alienated the other one or that have cr helped create the rivalry and the disagreements in places like Syria um, and and elsewhere and vis-a-vis -vis Iran too can we start with that anyone who wants to um, I could um, if you 
turn this on? Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, so Saudi Arabia um, has had to play a much more robust and forward-leading role in the region uh, for three reasons. First, because um, it feels uh, threatened by the rise of Iran, and it's not going to fail to act on that. And that's, that's just a uh, circumstance that would have warranted a more robust Saudi regional posture anyway. Right? Secondly is the um, collapse of the traditional centers of our Arab power and influence. Uh, Cairo is looking inward. Damascus is uh, ripped apart. Baghdad is, um, you know, put from a national point of view, post-apocalyptic almost. You know, so the, these power centers, traditional power centers in the Arab world, are non-functional. Uh, and they either simply can't rule their own territory or, as in the case of Egypt, um, they look uh, abroad in such a limited way that it constitutes an extension of domestic policy. For example, Egypt's concern in Gaza is not really a foreign, but it's more of a domestic policy issue. Same with, with Libya. I mean, there's, there's uh, such a geographical proximity that becomes very hard to see this as projecting power much further than the border. It's, you know, it's in, in, uh, in, in the same way that I think Turkey's concern about Kurds, especially in Syria, is, is again almost more of a domestic issue than a foreign policy issue. So because of this vacuum of Arab leadership, I think Saudi Arabia has had to step up UAE too, some Qatar in its own way. There's just a vacuum of Arab leadership. And uh, the third is the um, decreased role of the United States that you pointed out. And in that context, then, uh, I think all these three things come together, uh, particularly the, the, uh, uh, the, the relative pulling back of the United States during the Obama administration. But as I think uh, Trump's America First policies, though they're they're hard to read. Um, they haven't been very coherently defined yet. But they look like uh, extending some of Obama's caution, right? And, and the idea that you really, uh, the last thing you want is another war in the Middle East and stuff like that. Uh, and that other countries, the, 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 the notion of burden sharing, if there's one idea that's consistent between uh, Obama's foreign policy and Trump's foreign policy is this emphasis on burden sharing that they both have. And that in, to Saudi eyes translates into fight your own wars. Now, for them, they've done that in Yemen, right? All they've asked for is some support, and now they're getting crucified for it. Now, of course, one can, it's no problem making the case against the Yemen war, both in theory and in practice, and that's not a problem. But I'm just saying, from the point of view of um, burden sharing, it's problematic to lecture a country like Saudi Arabia ad nauseum about how they need to fight their own wars. And then when they do, they get extremely upset and put sanctions on them. So I mean, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not attacking any of this. I'm just saying, think about it in terms of burden sharing and becomes very problematic. Now, the, the uh, relative vacuum that the US sets up, and, and there was a sense that the US was uh, you know, sort of uh, looking into a potential arrangement with Iran that didn't, because of the JCPOA, that didn't pan out. Um, and there's a real anxiety about not just the American presence, but the reliability of the United States. So all of this prompts Saudi Arabia to take a, uh, a more robust role. And then this is magnified by the role first as defense minister and then as the crown prince of Mohammed bin Salman, who is a very audacious, let's put it that way, you can go in, in, at times certainly reckless uh, uh, leader. And so you combine all of that, and you've got, a, uh, within the limitations of what they can do, a fairly aggressive uh, Saudi uh, regional policy. Uh, I think uh, Turkey has defined it, since the coup especially, has defined its interests more narrowly uh, than before. But where they uh, have identified something as a crucial interest, for example, preventing the rise of a unified PKK statelet in northern Syria, they have intervened very forcefully to stop it, even to the point of almost confronting American troops. 
right, in, in Manbij and places like that, which did not happen, but was on the brink of happening and uh, could have happened. Um, so what I'm suggesting ultimately is that uh, the, the lack of U.S. or the, the reduction of U.S. leadership and the sense, at least in Riyadh and possibly in Ankara as well, probably, I, would, well, I, I defer to you on that, that the U.S. is not only less assertive but less reliable creates a situation where these countries, uh, you know, not just Saudi Arabia and Turkey, but others, are looking to define and secure their own interests, independent of the United States, and, and are operating in an unstable area where terms of reference and balance of power is being negotiated in real time, right, and in a very changing kaleidoscopic environment. And that, I think, does exacerbate a sense of rivalry, a sense of anxiety, a sense of confrontation, et cetera. What, what do you think? I believe you, you said that um, it was actually the Russian intervention mm. in Syria that broke apart the Turkish-Saudi agreement on who to support there. That. Oh, who, yeah, Sam, sorry, that. sorry, Hussein. Mm -hmm. And that... Um, from that point on, you had Turkey um, more concerned about containing the Kurds, and therefore you have a you have a confrontational policy because it had, the Gulf Arabs had been supporting the Syrian Democratic Forces mm -hmm. and the YPG, and right. I mean that's something that Turkey yeah. objects to. That actually has something to do with the the, the relationship between the United States and Russia, and right. who's involved and who's engaged and who isn't. Well. Uh, if we are talking about the Russia, uh, is it open? Yeah. Well, if we are talking about the Russia, uh, the Turkish-Russian relations or the complications in Syria is out of a necessity, uh, because when Turkey, you know, uh, downed the Russian jet uh, in Syria, uh, there was a brief moment of expectation in Turkey that there's there's going to be, you know, regional and the U.S. support to Turkey if. If you all want to, you know, the limit Russian role mm -hmm. in Syria, this was a perfect, you know, opportunity. But but that did not, yeah, that, that didn't happen. And you know, the earlier on, uh, when President Obama said, you know, the Assad is not a le le legitimate leader and he must go, mm -hmm. uh, up to that point, uh, Turkey did not seize the relation with Assad regime. But despite, you know, this enormous domestic pressure. Erdogan kept the, the relation with the Assad regime. But after that, you know, there was an expectation that the United States is going to do something. But it turned out to a presidential brainstorming or something, you know, an, in, an intellectual declaration, and it did not happen too. So uh, it was, you know, a self-help from a realist point of view to ally with Russia uh, to pursue, you know, this Turkish... Uh, military operation against the PKK to prevent, you know, this emergence of wider PKK, PKK state uh, uh, over there. That's, you know, mostly an out of necessity. But when it comes to, you know, the Astana talks, the Turkey, Iran, and, and Russia, uh, Turkey is, you know, a different perspective on Iran in Syria. Well, Turkey certainly wants to isolate Iran mm -hmm. in Syria. But however, Turkey considers Iran... Uh, part of, you know, solution too. Uh, so there should be, you know, uh, there is still belief that there is room for diplomacy with, with, with Iran. So there should be, you know, a more complicated, multi-leveled approach according to Ankara against Iran. Uh, you know, the Iranian role should be limited inside Syria, but however, diplomatically also Iran uh, should be persuaded uh, to, you know, act responsibly in Syria, which will ever happen. Uh, that's, again, a matter of time to see. Ambassador Crocker, do you want to comment on this American-Russian involvement? Yes. Uh, the fact that everything worth listening to has been said won't stop me from saying it again. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Hussein in particular touches on, I, I think, a, a core issue here. Um, it's what is the role of the U.S. not just in this region but globally um, uh, these seven plus decades since the end of World War II. I mean, you know, we, um, 
in America created the post-war world order, if you will. I mean, uh, NATO came, uh, sorry, United Nations came out of the San Francisco Conference. Um, the uh, post-war international financial order out of Bretton Woods. That would be Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, not Bretton Woods, France. Um, and, of course, NATO. Um, you flash back to the end of World War I, where the U.S. Uh, basically was sidelined uh, by um, the French and the British, uh, certainly sidelined in this region. Um, uh, and what we got then, uh, you got a two-decade truce between two halves of a horrific world war. That's all it was, mm -hmm. 1918, 1938. Yeah. Uh, well, with U.S. leadership internationally since World War II, um, uh, we have seen a world, in spite of things like Vietnam, uh, uh, that has been broadly at peace in a way it never was before. So before we kind of say, uh, damn, the Senate was right to vote down the League of Nations thing. I wish we could do that again. Um, consider the consequences. If we do not lead, who will? Uh, I fear the answer to that is no one will lead uh, because no one can. Uh, it's not that I stay up nights worrying about the Chinese taking over the world. It's that the Chinese, nor anyone else, is not going to be able even to manage conflict. Uh, and as we look at what's happening in Turkey, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, we, we kind of see the, uh, you know, where this could go. Uh, and again, this, as you so rightly point out, and I think both of you have made this point, this did not start with President Trump. Right. It started with President Obama. Yeah. Now, uh, Trump has elevated it to an art form uh, by, <laughs> you know, pulling us out of the TPP and the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, uh, Right. And the JCPOA, which, uh, yeah. by the way, uh, again, uh, some in the Obama administration totally oversold that to our our peril and loss mm -hmm. uh, by pretending it was more than what it was, and what it what it was is a reasonably good arms control agreement, exactly. not a treaty of peace and friendship. But that is that spooked the Saudis and yeah. and the rest of the Gulf. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so so again, what are the consequences going down the line? Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, as you, as you point out, uh, uh, took a look around and said, well, well we're on our own here. Uh, so we're going to go whack the Yemenis because yeah. they desperately need it. Yeah. Um, uh, they let us know, what, uh, 48 hours, 72 hours before, uh, and that, that was done mill to mill uh, to uh, Lloyd Austin, who was in Commander Central Command. And the Saudis weren't asking. No. They were telling us, we're, we're going in, you've got some enablers we really, really would like to have, and we hope you'll give them to us, but if you don't, we're going anyway. Well, for someone of my generation, that was unthinkable, that the, the Saudis would ever be in that kind of position. Uh, and I, I think you, as you say quite rightly, um, uh, that may not be where they wanted to be, but it is where they are, and then the irony of us not having been there at the creation, are now saying it's not going well, uh, you need to pull out. But that's also a reality if you look at the Senate uh, vote yesterday, or day before. Uh, yeah, just a couple of other quick things. Uh, <coughs> uh, the Turks and the Kurds. Uh, I was very much involved in the run-up to March 2003 as Deputy Assistant Secretary covering the Gulf. Uh, with the effort to uh, make our efforts in Iraq as successful as they could possibly be. Uh, one key element of that was having a northern front uh, to bring the 4th Infantry D Division down through Turkey uh, and into northern Iraq. Um, well, that didn't happen, uh, thanks to the Turkish General Staff largely that managed to see that what at first looked like parliamentary approval was actually not because there were not enough uh, deputies to make it legal. Um, we were prepared to give the Turks very wide latitude vis-a-vis -vis 
the Iraqi Kurds, mm -hmm. dangerously wide in my view as someone involved in our processes. Uh, so if the Turks have encountered uh, problems with um, Iraqi Kurds, they have only themselves to blame. If, if, had that vote succeeded, uh, it would be a totally different landscape, literally, in, in, um, in northern Iraq. I just toss that out there. I don't know how widely known it is, but it was highly significant at the time. Uh, the other thing I'd point out, and I know this sounds like minutia, but these things count. Uh, we, of course, have had a long, strong mill-to-mill -mill relationship with Turkey. Um, uh, a, Turkey is a major customer for our weapon systems. Um, right now, we're working on an F-35 sale of very large proportions. Yep. Boy, but you know what? If, if Turkey actually goes ahead with that S-400 air defense system from Russia, I don't think that F-35 sale is going to go. Uh, not, not for political reasons. It's because it would uh, almost certainly compromise our most advanced technologies yeah. to the Russians hmm. through, that, through that system. So keep, don't get lost in the details, but you, some of these things get very, very important as you're looking ahead to uh, what kind of relationship we're going to have. Well, before we come back to... Um, American policy um, and what influence it has had on this rivalry. Uh, let's come to something you said, Hussein. It is, where do the interests of the state begin and end compared to where the interests of Erdogan begin and end? What is it about, is there something about the nature of these two states, Turkey being um, well, having some grieve, some post-Ottoman grievances that carried all the way through the 1920s until today, um, and uh, having different, you know, ethnic and sectarian makeup, um, and being a democratic country, um, on the one hand, and then Saudi Arabia having some grievances against the Ottoman Empire for the fall of the first two. Houses of Saud, and um, seeing itself as the custodian of the two holy mosques, um, having pride in its own form of government, which has taken the country from from sand into uh, modern economy and uh, society. Um, to what extent uh, do these differences in the nature of the state contribute to the rivalry or make competition difficult. And then you come to Erdogan, the man, and MBS, the man, where you have one person who feels, Erdogan feels rebuffed by the West, specifically about not getting into the EU, and is an Islamist, and is committed to uh, Sunni Islamism, whereas MBS is... Um, someone who is uh, trying to engineer a top-down change and, uh, does, and, and does think that their Salafism is um, worth defending and that their form of government is worth defending against the different vision that is being espoused by Turkey. You have the nature of the state, you have the nature of the two men. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit in terms of why they have different policies. Well, uh, 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 of course, I'm not, you know, the part of government or I'm not a policy person anymore. And what I say is, is a pure uh, a, a academic analysis. Uh, my sense is that Mohammed bin Salman, you know, uh, reminds King Abdullah uh, in Turkey. So the, when King Salman came to power, it was a you know, very welcome development in Turkey that you know, a less assertive but more rational, wise king is going to follow you know, more moderate policies, you know, a rational containment policy against Iran, you know, uh, a wiser you know, uh, Western line 
in the, the, the region. And mostly, you know, this, when this power shift uh, happened to uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, so this, you know, kind of has been uh, what we call in the psychology some sort of return of the repressed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, uh, for, former feelings uh, to, towards uh, Saudi Arabia under uh, King, King Abdullah. Well, looking from, you know, uh, two different perspectives, in Turkey, you know, uh, there is still, you know, uh, a secular urban people good enough to protect, you know, the Turkey's modernization. Uh, up to, you know, to Arab Spring, Erdogan was also using this as an asset mm -hmm. and st still using it. You know, he and most of his people, they are products of Turkey's mm -hmm. modern secular system. They are graduates of those universities, the education system. Well, Erdogan talks about, you know, a new generation, uh, so on and so forth, but but all those generations are going to be you know, of the graduates of the same system. He did not initiate a new education system, a new education thinking. Well, what what he says mostly helped to consolidate its support basis. But but the Turkish state and the you know the uh, uh, lots of years of you know the modernization experience is still over there, and and, and it's going to resist. Uh, but uh, Erdogan is now the only leader who can have the, you know, the majority support and this uh, change from parliamentary system to pres presidential system made him you know, the only possible le le leader for a foreseeable f future. So the only possible way to get him out of picture was you know, the uh, coup, which is an you know, undesirable thing in any democracy, and it also failed. So here, from Erdogan's perspective, he has, you know, the majority uh, support at all. But, but however, there are still, you know, outside powers who are trying to figure out how to get rid of him. So this psychology, the survival psychology, is not prevailing. But I think he's going to get over it uh, uh, not much lay, lay, lay later. Don't forget, you know, this constitutional system change, all the elections, this political lift with the Gulen group. There has been so many wars. Uh, you know, one man can fight one war at a time, but but he's fighting many wars. So, so this psychology of survival is guiding him at the moment and his political elite, and which is also sidelining Turkish state away. That's why, you know. What Dr. Ibish said, Erdogan and the state, there is, you know, seemingly this difference, but it is going to converge at some point. Otherwise, it is not sustainable. It, it will, you know, fall apart. Well, again, you know, from an academic perspective, Erdogan and Mohammed bin Salman get along. Uh, if they can find the common ground that, you know, uh, if Mohammed bin Salman gives an image that he can control UAE, he can follow, you know, a balanced uh, Iran destabilization uh, project. This is what Erdogan likes to hear now. But, but however, Mohammed bin Salman is, you know, he is an emerging le leader, and he made clear that he's going to eliminate all the rivals, Muslim Brotherhood, and Turkey is part of Muslim Brotherhood, and he is certain to eliminate him. So, so if there is a, you know. Uh, a common ground, Erdogan, what uh, most matter Erdogan is this, you know, not Muslim Brotherhood, but Islamic Brotherhood, he can for, forget all about and get along with it, like uh, he did with Putin. You know, in 2015, the, after the downing of jet, uh, Russian jet, you know, uh, uh, it sounded that he and Putin will never get along. But, right. but, but now you see, you know, they are, they, on daily basis, they are talking on the phone, uh, etc. I see, you know, looking at his practical side and looking uh, to the way he needs to uh, lead Turkey, I see, you know, a, from an optimist perspective, I'm always an optimist and an academic, uh, I see a likely convergence ahead. Yeah. Did I understand you to say that he's pragmatic enough to distance himself from the Muslim Brotherhood? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I also don't share, you know, the AKP is a Muslim Brotherhood party. Yeah. Well, one color is that, but but also there are other colors yeah. which can limit that. Yeah. Um, with regard to uh, MBS and Saudi Arabia, I mean, 
Uh, it's the decision-making process in Saudi Arabia uh, not only is murky, it's always been murky. It's, it's harder than Kremlinology. Uh, it's a more complex puzzle. The, uh, the dearth of good information, knowledgeable sources, et cetera, is, makes it almost a fool's game. Um, I do think, though, we can be uh, sure of two things. Number one is that uh, MBS, what, young, audacious, et cetera, has an enormous amount of power. Uh, and uh, the, bureauc- the, the, the uh, degree to which the changes that he has overseen in the past two years constitute an autogolpe, a self-coup, uh, which I've been calling it from the beginning since the Ritz-Carlton thing, uh, can't be overstated. The old system of Saudi Arabia, which was monarchical and f- sort of a modern feudalism with different fiefdoms and checks and balances and accountability within the royal family, and all that is, is pretty much wrecked. And there has been a tremendous concentration of power uh, around the, uh, the, the crown prince. And, but it also needs to be said that the authority for all of this comes from the king. You know, in other words, the, 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 uh, the king is a non-controversial figure relatively in Saudi Arabia. Uh, his authority is uncontested. His right to be king is uncontested. His, um, uh, his authority is really uncontested. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman does what he does precisely because of the... Uh, sense that he's doing it all under the rubric of the king, that the king has delegated all of this to him. And don't forget, this is a king who has already replaced a crown prince, right? Uh, Crown Prince Nayef was removed, and Mohammed bin Salman was put in as crown prince. And in fact, even before that, it was done. So the the point is that uh, it is not unthinkable that uh, from a structural point of view that uh, Mohammed bin Salman would not be the king. However, the amount of bureaucratic power that he has assembled and the apparent commitment of King Salman to his succession means that, in fact, he, he will be king. Now there's this very strange reality where um, he, he can't be king because he's become so radioactive in Washington. It would be very hard for him to come here, but he can't not be king because he's going to become king. We'll see how they figure that one out. But the point I'm making is that, well, I can't... In Turkey, it's easier to distinguish between national and institutional prerogatives and the uh, political or personal prerogatives. In Saudi Arabia, it's all deliberately, but systemically and in theory mixed up, right? It's a monarchy, absolute monarchy. So it's the tat is supposed to be moi. It's not, you know, this isn't an accident or a weird thing. Uh, at the same time, um, and in fact, that's one of the big uh, differences between uh, the where, where ideologically Saudi Arabia and Turkey, insofar as Turkey serves as a model for anybody, would immediately come into a problem is the republicanism of the Turkish model, of the AKP model, of the brotherhood model in the Arab world. I agree, AKP is not exactly a brotherhood party, but it is a Sunni uh, Islamist and Republican party. So it's in that sense... Well, majoritarian, yeah, if, if you can. That, that would be... Nice. Yeah. No, I understand what you mean. I think you're right. And none of that's true uh, of Saudi Arabia. Now, I just do want to say one thing uh, in addition. This business of Islamism, is, uh, I think you're absolutely right to locate the fundamental contradiction here between uh, Turkey and its uh, allies like Qatar on the one hand and UAE on the other hand. UAE is the party in the region that is categorically opposed unequivocally to all forms of political Islam and the politicization, the politicization of Islam and the Islamization of politics. Any version of that is anathema to Abu Dhabi's perspective and to UAE's perspective. They are committed to what amounts to secular politics in the region and to separation of religion and politics. Now, this, of course, is not really true of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia in a post-Arab Spring moment, particularly on, under MBS, is, is certainly anti-Muslim brotherhood to a very large extent, and anti-Islamist in a more general sense, in a way. But you can't 
have Saudi Arabia standing for a total break between religion and politics because Saudi Arabia presents itself as a religious state, as the custodian of the mosques and as the pure Islamic state in, with the Quran as its constitution and all that stuff. So it's not possible. Secondly, uh, you know, and you could say, well, there's a difference between uh, status quo Islamic politics and revolutionary Islamic politics or republican versus monarchical, all this. Okay. That, that, the point is there is no clear break in, in Saudi Arabia the way there, there is in the UAE. The second thing is that MBS is not categorically unwaveringly opposed to all Muslim brothers the way that the UAE is. The example here is Yemen. All right, uh, Saudi Arabia in the northern part of Yemen, where it has been operating, has been increasingly working with Al Islah, which is a Muslim Brotherhood party in Yemen, which presents itself as part of this wave of post Islamist groups led by Nahda and also the Justice and Development in Morocco, etc., who've broken with three aspects of Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, structure that are noxi uh, noxious and toxic to uh, Arab uh, governments, which is a, a revolutionary nature, conspiratorial nature, i.e. illegal underground, uh, and especially and above all transnational. So these groups say, well, we're not revolutionary, we don't want to change the system, we're not conspiratorial, we're not doing anything in secret, and we're not transnational. In other words, yeah, Nahda only comments on Tunisia and Tunisian foreign policy. Doesn't talk about Sudan or anything like that. And, and Al-Islah takes this position. Jordanian Muslim brothers take this position. The Moroccan uh, Islamists take this position. And it's, uh, it's one that I think in the end Saudi Arabia could easily uh, end up living with because it doesn't <laughs> threaten a return to Arab Spring or, or revolutionary or anything. It doesn't really threaten. UAE doesn't would the state. Doesn't threaten doesn't the, the state. States. Well, okay, so that's, that would potentially be a Saudi pers perspective. Uh, UAE, I think, would find all of it threatening. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. so there is a big distinction. So I just wanted to say you can imagine that in, in the next decades that if Erdogan emerges, is now recast as part of a post-Islamist, uh, you know, movement with the, with the lacking those three qualities, the revolutionary, conspiratorial, and transnational that I talked about, that Saudi Arabia could become very comfortable with that, potentially, or not. We have uh, less than 15 minutes, so can we get into American policy now? Uh, is there a way for the United States to re-engage to support both of these traditional allies in a way that um, helps them resolve some of their differences and helps us contain our adversaries. You know, I think Turkey, for example, is, would not be happy with an Iranian nuclear weapon. Mm. Turkey is not happy with Iran's expansion on the ground through the Shia Crescent to the Mediterranean. So how do we harness them together in this endeavor better than we've been doing? And um, um, what is it that um, Erdogan wants from the Khashoggi incident mm. that he would need to get? Uh, and is it going to be necessary for MBS to make some concessions because of the Khashoggi matter? Um, and is it useful for the United States to be imposing sanctions on Turkey and Saudi Arabia if we're going to be trying to uh, bring them closer together in in, a, in an effort to contain our common enemy, uh, common adversaries, which includes Russia, not, not only Iran. That's a big question, but it's a question about what should American policy be now. Ambassador Crocker, do you want to talk first about that? Uh, sure. Um, I think we can all be very brief here, because what American policy? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, th this has been a very interesting conversation to me thus far. I, I, in my remarks, I tried to point out that uh, uh, in obviously different roles, Saudi Arabia and Turkey have been absolutely critical uh, partners in the post-World War II international order. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I think that behooves us before we let all this drift away, uh, to go sit under a tree somewhere and consider what our vital interests um, uh, are, 
what they have been and where they're likely to go, and then bring uh, regional partners, traditional regional partners, into the conversation. Uh, you know, what does Turkey envision as uh, the the gains it would like to make? Uh, what are the losses they seek to avoid? Same thing elsewhere. Uh, but if you're going to do that, you've got to have a policy. Um, uh, and we're kind of short in that department. Um, I'd like to say it's just the Middle East, but it seems to be pretty well global right now, and I just go back to that kind of waking nightmare. If not us, then who? If not us, with what consequences for our own security and for international security? And I, I find that a fairly frightening view uh, right about now. On the, um, on the plus side, I think we've heard from um, both of my colleagues here that uh, there is a flexibility and a pragmatism really in both leaderships yep. um, to uh, who they could live with and who they can't. Uh, and I certainly garnered from that that we would have a lot to work with oh, yes. uh, in, in Ankara and in Riyadh if we had a framework <coughs> to work from. Right. Um, this isn't helped, of course, by the fact that this administration has uh, not seen fit to move expeditiously, if at all, on things like ambassadorial or geographic assistant secretary appointments. Right. Um, you know, two, almost two years in, uh, you don't have ambassadors in kind of really important places like Riyadh. Um, uh, Good so, nominee, though. Yes, yeah, great, great nominee, uh, though that does raise another question. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, John Abizade, of course, a career um, soldier, not a diplomat. Uh, in modern times, we've sent two career diplomats to Riyadh, um, both Arabus, uh, Jim Aiken and uh, Hugh Moran. Boy, the Saudis didn't like either of them. Uh, and, and both left short of tour. Uh, uh, what they don't seem to want in the kingdom is... Um, someone with the background and the skills to make, say, the politics of the royal family a little less opaque than they are. Right. Um, because opaque is what they want. Opaque is what they want. Now, uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, John Abizaid is a fluent Arabic speaker, but he certainly knows the kingdom and he knows the region. Uh, so let's see how he does mm -hmm. um, out there. Uh, obviously, this would be the worst possible time for the Saudis to take issue with... Um, uh, who we send to Riyadh, and he has had Audrey Mon, of course, but so did Hugh Moran until they found out how deeply he could get into their society. <laughs> um, so, again, not to get lost in the weeds there, but, uh, um, you know, I, I think what we've done here is to uh, convince ourselves of how important these relationships really are and that we've got a lot to work with as well as against. <laughs> But then that just puts us back on the uh, that overarching question. Uh, you can't do any of this without a policy. Can, can I just say, I mean, I, I think from uh, a Saudi perspective, a return of U.S. leadership would be most welcome, and there would be a tremendous lot to work with. I, I, I'll, I'll defer to my colleague on uh, on Ankara's perspective, but I think the uh, the Saudis would be uh, are hoping for a, uh, a much more robust American presence. And uh, they've clearly have bitten off more than they can chew in some places. And in other places, like um, in Syria, they're relying entirely on the United States uh, to indirectly pursue their interests. And in Iraq, it's got to be a, a collaborative effort by Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Kuwait and others um, uh, working politically and financially uh, to incentivize the Iraqis to come back into the Arab fold and get distance from Iran with the United States playing its role. And I think Iran has a problem in Iraq when it faces a combination of uh, what the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait bring to the table. But confronting any of those three on their own, uh, I think Iran is in much better shape to continue to wield undue authority in Iraq. So it's a good example of where these countries actually um, need each other even to succeed in the very limited policies that uh, are being uh, pursued right now. So I, there's a tremendous lot to work with, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
to what extent you are following the developments in Iran, but you know the destabilization of Iran is mm. is a very likely pro, uh, prospect. What yeah. you know the President Trump is doing, and the, you know out of this Sunni Shia revolution, Iran may come on the brink of collapse yeah. uh, so, sooner than we assume. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we have you know Iran in destabilization on the prospect, and what we need to you know to deal with Syria and Yemen. Uh, so there should be, you know, a simultaneous uh, policy to stabilize, you know, Syria and Yemen in order to deal with this, you know, this emergent destabilization. It's, it's going to, you know, uh, have enormous spillover effect to Iraq, to Iran, to Afghanistan, to Central Asia. So how we are going to deal with? Okay, okay uh, these tough guys, you know, the powerful le le leaders, they agreed on to destabilize in Iran, but, but how they are going to handle it, you know. Uh, Is that a policy for reducing Iran's influence in Yemen, Iraq, and Syria? What, but, but destabilizing Iran? But, but, but I don't know what, what's going to happen afterwards. Mm, so, right. so, you know, uh, there should be a policy right. to, to deal with that, but also, you know, there should be simultaneous policies to work harder on Syria and Yemen mm -hmm. to at least, you know, the, uh, hand, handle that one. So, you know, that signal, you know, a kind of signal from Saudi Arabia, from the United States, that you know, there is a clear plan and policy on on Iran, uh, as well as you know, a renewed you know engagement to Yemen and uh, Syria is going to be you know very good signal to Anc Ankara to pursue it, to be be you know uh, on the board in all those initiatives. But but you know, before seeing uh, the the agenda or the future policy on Iran in Turkey, Turkey is going to, you know, try very hard, uh, like we have seen in, you know, this uh, pre-U.S. Uh, invasion of of Iraq. We'll see, you know, similar developments and lots of disappointment between uh, these countries. Can I add one very quick thing? I, it occurs to me that t it's worth saying that a strong U.S. engagement, strong assertion of American leadership would be so welcome in Riyadh that uh, if there were, over a short period of time, a re-establishment of trust and confidence in the United States, the United States could even shift to trying to be a balancing power in the region with success and with the backing of Riyadh. It's, it's what makes it so hard is not that um, U.S. policy isn't pleasing to Riyadh. It's that there's no confidence. If there's confidence and trust, you could, you could have even a more challenging policy and, and be successful. I've tried to reflect a lot of the questions that came out of the audience here, but, I, but there's one I want to read, actually read it, and it's for Ambassador Crocker. Uh, we'll make it the last question. Uh, mm -hmm. If... Uh, you were to write a new version of the perfect storm memo, what would your central and main warning be to the current administration? It uh, would be pretty much what it would have been with the previous administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I know this is getting repetitive, but it's important enough to repeat. Um, do not cast aside American global leadership. Um, without some very careful consideration of the consequences. Now, we've, we've talked about that in the Middle Eastern context. Mm -hmm. uh, well, take a look at Europe. Yep. Um, uh, the rise of uh, forces throughout Europe, basically, of uh, uh, extreme right-wing orientation. Uh, I'm, among other things, on the Broadcasting Board of Governors, we oversee Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, all official USG civilian media. Uh, we have restarted our Hungarian language service through Radio Free Europe um, uh, out of concern of the way the current government seems to be controlling liber individual liberties and press liberties, and you may have seen the uh, the stories over the last couple of days, uh, how they are shutting down their own media now. Mm -hmm. uh, why is this important? Um, because horrific things have come out of Europe in the 20th century. Two world wars and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, do 
and World War II and the Holocaust are still in living memory. Do we really think that can never, that kind of thing can never happen again? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we have reached the end of history and Frank Fukuyama wishes to hell he'd never written that book. <laughs> uh, and has been honest enough to say so. Um, uh, so yes, our, our post-World War II effort was directed at containment of the Soviets, but a subtext was um, European unity not just against the Soviet Union, but European unity under uh, U.S. leadership to structurally start to develop the, uh, the institutions and the orientations uh, that would make a return to that kind of conflict and uh, genocides impossible. Um, well, we can see now uh, how possible that might get. Uh, so it isn't it isn't just the Middle East. It isn't just the Middle East and Europe. Uh, by abdicating in the uh, in East Asia, well, the Chinese are building new islands every day, mm -hmm. um, which they're using now for for uh, air and sea basing. So, again, uh, my message would not be um, on the Middle East except uh, by example. It would be on the world. Mm. Uh, what kind of world do we want to see, uh, and what are its implications for us? Uh, I just want to say that within a day or so, this the um, video of this conference will be on our website, which is www.mepc.org, and then this transcript will be in the next issue of the journal, which will be the Winter 2018 Journal, which will be out probably after Christmas. And uh, having said that, I want to thank the panel very much thank for you. a great discussion, in my view. Thank you.